everyone and welcome to this episode of Performance Cafe and Coffee Companions where today I have an extra special coffee companion with us and that is my good friend Jenna Siegel. So um, other than saving me from my academic career, which yes is a long story but a beautiful one, uh, Jenna is also a registered industrial psychologist with a passion for educating and upskilling young professionals entering the workplace. Her tertiary education was completed at WITS, where she obtained her Master's of Arts degree in industrial slash organizational psychology. Thereafter, she obtained her coaching certificate from the from SACAP, so the South African College of Applied Psychology, where we met. And she has in the industry experience as a trainer, coach, facilitator, and consultant in the corporate industry, nationally and internationally. In her current work within the academia, her goal is to raise the standard of excellence of every student through increased accountability, self-efficiency, and self-awareness. And on that note, a very big hello to Jenna. Hi, Innocent. I'm very well. I look very pale. I look otherwise very well. <laughs> we don't call it pale. We say it's the summer colors. Oh, yes, the no. cool colors. Uh, you're summer right now. I'm dead of winter. So. <laughs> well, we're not anywhere near the dead of winter yet, and hopefully this uh, discussion will not. warm the cockles of everyone's hearts. So, Jenna, thanks so much for joining. Uh, it is so lovely to be here with you today. I actually thought of it the other day. I think we know each other for almost three years now already. The time has flown by very quickly, and we've had lots of adventure in the meanwhile many <laughs> and so i felt as if on performance cafe i've asked a whole lot of people about their business views on performance and then i thought well i'd love to speak to you because besides the business view you've actually studied humans so tell us what is your take on uh, on performance i thought a lot about this uh, when I knew that we were discussing performance and it came to me in a flash of a moment uh, because I think from a human psychological point of view a performance or performance can be related to just the effort or the outcome of effort or energy that we give to a particular project small big whatever the case is so the outcome is ultimately the performance. And I, I do have to tell you that even though I've studied psychology for a while now, I also, when the word performance comes up, my inner child, well, I used to dance as a child and, um, and a young adult, and a performance for us was months and months and months of practice and getting your skill together and making sure that what you put up was something that people ultimately wanted to watch and something that was beautiful and or fun or sad whatever it was so it was it was an outcome it was a culmination of a lot of effort that was put in um so i think from that point of view it's not necessarily at all what we think about from a business perspective like the time you put in or um how many hours you've done um but it's actually the outcome of the effort you put in. And so true when you say that, because that's what we see now with the shift to remote work, is people are trying to yeah. manage day-to-day -day tasks and activities, right? Absolutely. Uh, from a traditional leadership or management point of view, you know, if you saw someone sitting in an office for eight hours, you would imagine that in those eight hours, they would complete certain tasks, which would add to their ultimate performance. But now we're seeing that it doesn't matter where you sit, doesn't matter who is around you, ultimately you need to complete certain tasks. And uh, where and how you do it doesn't actually matter. It's just the outcome. If you can be honest and, you know, share and communicate what you would like at the end of it, that's what really mm. matters. Mm. And so... I then need to ask you ideally placed because I've got this kick going of productive kindness. Mm. And for me, productive kindness is the balance between how do I keep my business going and how do I still human in the organization? Mm. And so 
I want to ask you, uh, how do we do this? <laughs> I think yeah, the human is the, the key phrase that, that we keep on going back to. Every article, maybe it's just because I'm so based within uh, seeing the human side of things and psychologists that I know that are working within industry, that are working within the therapeutic space, um, the human is becoming, every conversation is centered around it because without the human, you know, it doesn't matter how much beautiful technology you put in, it doesn't matter how many uh kind of rands you've you've accumulated uh, if the human isn't able to complete their work then you'd have no performance it's very different to the industrial kind of change of the industrial revolution of the past the fourth industrial revolution what we're coming into is yes we've got more technology but it means we need more human, um, which means creativity, which means innovation, which means um, emotions. <laughs> and um, emotions take up a wait, lot of energy. Wait, yes. Emotions in business, Jenna? I know. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's something that not every manager has learned to deal with not every employee when you go into becoming an expert in something only certain people deal with emotions on a professional level but yet we all have emotions so you know it's not about ignoring emotions it's not about pretending they're not there it's actually about embracing the fact that we have emotions and emotions can fuel that kind of energy you put towards that outcome, that performance. Mm -hmm. Emotions can also deter from it. So for management, mm -hmm. it's also about dealing with that idea that emotions are now part of your job. But but okay, hold on, Jenna. I'm a lot older than you. Mm -hmm. What happened? What happened to the statement of leave home at home? This is your job. Uh -huh. So I don't know if you can see innocent, but I am at home. Uh, this Wait, is let's show the everyone. boundaries. Yeah, this is this is my office, which is situated in my home. And I think for a lot of people, they are experiencing something quite similar, uh, mm. if not a little bit more uh, dramatic in the overlap between home and work. So the idea that we can just you know, that idea even of the commute, the commute used to be the place where you would kind of either zone out or focus on the traffic and, you know, get your mind prepared for the day, maybe leave the emotions behind if that was something that, you know, you could do, which ultimately humans struggle with anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So now that those boundaries that we had put in place from a, you know, 20, 21st century workplace are disappearing. So how do we equip people with the ability to just stop ignoring the fact that it actually does happen that we feel these emotions and it and it does interfere sometimes or enhance our performance so i suppose next you're going to tell us heaven forbid that we need empathy in the workplace how does that work Ooh. so empathy is absolutely a skill that everyone can learn it's a tool that every single individual can build on it for themselves. And empathy is very closely tied to this, this concept that we call emotional intelligence. So again, intelligence is something that we can always build on, we can always learn about, we can always practice. So emotional intelligence is quite the same. Um, and empathy is, is not about feeling people's emotions. It's not about uh, taking on people's emotions, but it's about recognizing that there's an emotion present in a person and almost reflecting that back at them, um, just to make the person often feel that they're not alone or they they are 100% uh, validated in the fact that that emotion is present. So, you know, with COVID right now, I don't know about you, you know, but like I have been anxious on a on a almost weekly basis, you know, especially when we were in the depths of things, when we were waiting for the president to tell us, are we open, are we closed, who's this, where's that? Even with the, the vaccinations now, my anxiety levels are extremely high. And one of the things that one of my managers has done recently is that she's checked in with us. And it's not about telling us what to do. It's not about uh, checking that we're, we are 
in on track it's just about saying how are your emotions even if you could say like out of a scale of one to ten how high is your anxiety i don't know how your anxiety is right now but on a scale of one to ten how does it feel and how are you potentially you know you, how are you in your space because ultimately if we can speak our emotions our emotions don't always overwhelm us because i don't know people tend to think that emotions disappear are you one of those <laughs> You know, it's emotions like don't it's disappear. Like ignore yeah. it if they will go away. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But ultimately, if you don't look at that tooth, you know, that tooth is is, is going to fester and it's going to infect and it's mm. going to actually start mm. to harm you. So if we don't deal with emotions at all, um, it tends to become a little bit deeper and deeper and the problems mm. themselves seem to unravel sometimes. I mean, those are in extreme social circumstances, but I feel like a pandemic, mm. a global pandemic is quite extreme. So empathy is just that tool to be able to say to people, these emotions exist, you know, how are you, what are we, you know, what can I do to help you in terms of, you know, not always moving past it, but reflecting on it and voicing mm. those emotions. So Jenna, I'm I'm hearing a difference between empathy and sympathy. Mm. Okay, yeah. Can you, so, can you help us understand that? Because as a as a now as a as a manager of previously large teams, right now I work for myself. But you know, if you have ten people working for you, if they all come and cry on your shoulder, you're not going to get much work done. So no. how do we do this? And 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 what do we look for? What do we use? Right. So there was a there was a beautiful story that I used to tell when I was working in the corporates um, with a company called Circle and Square. And mm. they do training. It's based on emotional intelligence. And the difference between sympathy and, and empathy is that sympathy is about how I feel about your emotions versus empathy mm. is about how you feel about your emotions and reflecting that. So sympathy, for instance, no, have you ever gone to a funeral where there's these people, they're crying and you think, wow, they must have been really close to the person mm. who's passed away. But then you, you ask them, how do you know? It's like, no, I don't know them, but I'm just really sad right now. Okay. And that's sympathy. That means yes. my emotions are present because of your emotions. And yes, okay. if someone has to come to you every five minutes and say, like, I'm really anxious, I'm really anxious, you might even start to get anxious yourself. That's absolutely sympathetic. Mm. But empathy is rather, you know, if you if you let's say go to a funeral, if you go and you visit someone who's grieving and you say to the person, you know, I can absolutely see that this is a terrible time for you right now. And mm. maybe if you need some food or if you need anything to be done, I'm I'm around the corner. Or my phone call away. So it's not mm -hmm. taking on the emotions at all. It's rather yeah. reflecting on what the person has in them and just saying to them, I see it. Um, Brene Brown actually does it really beautifully. She's got a beautiful um, a little, uh, it's part of her TED talk and she has a little animation out there from RSA. And it's definitely worth watching because it talks to this particular topic. Yeah, I'll add the link to this. To the session notes it's actually brilliant it does really explain the, that concept beautifully so i think one of the challenges is that and and i certainly have seen it is that we will have lots of wonderfully technically skilled managers mm -hmm. who have mbas and lots of in, lots of intellectual information Yes. But they don't know how to practice this in business. Mm. And I think it's because maybe as, as humans, we just not good at coping with the negatives. But for example, mm. just as we've clarified empathy and sympathy, where does compassion lie? And is this something we can use in business to be emotionally intelligent? So compassion, especially when we're, we're dealing with so much heightened emotions all the time. Um, I think compassion is not necessarily just needed, but it's it's part of almost an everyday occurrence these days. Um, you know, before we might have said, oh, people are using terrible experiences to try to get out of work. But now mm. there's no getting away from the fact that that every day can, can bring on these stresses. Um, mm. So compassion is really about, um, you know, not 
again, not feeling for the person, but also just embracing the fact that they're going through really tough times. And if you can distribute work a little bit differently, if you can think about performance, not necessarily in the you need to be at the office at eight o'clock till five, perhaps giving them, you know, a different day or a different kind of deadline to and changing behavior a little bit to mm. make sure that the emotions are dealt with um, or the emotions are taken into account where you know I don't think a lot of the times you know you're a professional you want to get things done as manager you absolutely need to have a responsibility because at the end of the day it, you have the accountability um, mm. but it's communication at the end of the day that that maybe we're really not so good at um and we thought we were good at before covid but Mm. covid kind of showed us that that communication goes beyond Mm. just telling people what to get done or how 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 are you and then expecting i'm fine thanks Um, Uh, it might not be an i'm fine thanks Uh, compassion is 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 about seeing beyond just that i'm fine thanks i don't know what do you think i Oh, good question. So, yes. So, it's interesting. I suppose for me, empathy and sympathy is how you approach the person. Compassion for me is how you approach solving the problem. I think that's nice. Because if I've used empathy to understand what what is driving grief, anxiety, whatever the case may be, compassion is I'm going to take whatever skill I just used to get this get to this point, I'm going to extend it into a process almost. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Good question. So, I'd never actually thought of that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's get back to asking you questions. I might... <laughs> now, now, I have a, now, now I have a really stupid moment and, and then we've undone all the good. Um, so, I think another sort of... Um, Another sort of problem with emotion in business is caring and nurturing is seeing a mother's role Mm -hmm. and how, you know, like if you owe shame, poor little Jen, don't worry, I'll take care of you. How do I get to move Jen from, oh, she was battling back to, oh, Jen is back on her feet? Because I think a lot of managers are also, as you say, there's a big weariness around letting situations become a trend in an organization. A person never feels the need to take accountability again. Absolutely. And I think that's also something called um, compassion fatigue, um, Mm. where we get so tired of being so thoughtful and uh, being so so much in the the mindset of the people that you're talking to that you almost get so exhausted from always having to think about what you're going to have to say or always have to think about you know the actions that you take and how that the consequences are and the compassion fatigue is definitely something you see with people who work in the um kind of uh, first responders or psychologists and things like that um but I my my tool that I use, and this is again something that I was introduced to when I worked at Circle and Square, was a, tr- a transactional analysis. So, a theory it was brought about um, by Eric Byrne, and it does follow the the footsteps of uh, psychoanalysis in the sense that a lot of what we talk about is not necessarily on the surface of our. Th- thinking awareness, you could say, the conscious. Mm. And Mm. what we do um, in our day-to-day worlds isn't always about what is uh, we're 100% aware of. So some of the things are under the surface. You know, they they creep up, especially when we're stressed, when we're tired. A lot Mm. of these unconscious forces tend to pop to the surface. And what transactional analysis does is that it takes personality, it takes situations, and it helps us to guide the conversations in a way that's quite helpful and especially helpful for performance. And getting the energy to a place where we get to that rational, we get to that logical kind of uh, task-focused individual. And, you know, going to your comment about the idea of nurturing being a woman's role, um, or a motherly role, you could say. And mm. it's 
it, it's not offensive in any way, but at the same time, it's not very helpful. Um, mm. It's not helpful, you know, for uh, if you're now seen as an extremely nurturing person to be f- labeled as, as a Lakad Mahla. Um, and mm. it's a role and a, and a label that I've gotten many times in a team specific sp- space. Um, mm. But I still think that nurturing, there's a very big difference between nurturing or um, taking taking into consideration people's emotions versus um you know, taking on a taking on their actual responsibilities, or um, being so adaptive to the situation that you almost start doing their work for them. Those are totally yeah. different things. And transactional analysis actually helps us with that. 